Hey there, welcome to the Game Artist Podcast. My name is Ryan Kingsline. I am the founder of the Game Art Institute, where we train artists for the career of their lives. In this podcast, we interview amazing game artists to see what makes them tick and see how they got where they are today. So sit back, relax. I look forward to sharing their journey with you. All right, guys, thanks so much for joining me here. Mark, thank you. Of course, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, this is about the only way I get to chat with you, actually, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Even though you're like, I don't know, what is that? 2,000 feet away? Something like that? I don't know. All right, guys, welcome. I have Mark Burnett with me here, who's the founder of Cube Brush, and uh, he's also got an awesome art station here. And uh, so I thought a lot about what to chat about today. And if you have questions, make sure you shout them out. But Mark, why don't we start with you just talking about your background and what you do? Yeah, well, what I do, uh, I am founder and CEO of QBrush, and yep. uh, that's what I do most of my day. So it's an e-commerce platform where sellers can open stores, free stores, sell their digital content, and customers can find pretty much anything for, for digital art on there. And yeah, so that's what I do every day. We have a team of 13 people, and so it's just uh, yeah, a lot of business. And sprinkled in here and there in my schedule, I save some time for art to work on my own projects. But uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Ah, oh, great. I always hear from Mai that you're working. Like it's afternoon, Mark's drawing or painting. Yeah. Uh, when yeah. I, I, <laughs> when I pick the kids up. I work, and, yeah, I work a lot. <laughs> it's fun, so. so I heard you had this like crappy game job and you quit it at this like ridiculous company. Oh, yeah. You mean Blizzard? Yeah, just Blizzard, whatever, right? Uh, so <laughs> tell me about this. You, you've you been in the industry. You, you know, you're not just an entrepreneur. You Not that that's a bad thing, but um, you, you've had yeah, a bit of a career. A, yeah, I did a bit of a switch there. Yes, I've been in, so so far, most of my life, I've been in games, I guess. The ratio still favors that. Yeah, I started working in video games around 20 when I was uh, living in Montreal. Mm-hmm. I'm originally from uh, Montreal, Canada. And uh, yeah, I worked there for about two years and then I switched over to Blizzard and I stayed there for a little over seven years and uh, worked on, on Overwatch, worked on uh, Heroes of the Storm, a little bit of Starcraft, a little bit of Starcraft. And uh, it's, yeah, it was, it was a ton of fun, but um, I always, you know, I always had plans to start my own thing eventually and I saw kind of a, a need and so I just jumped on it pretty much. Mm. What, um, why, I guess, <laughs> why, you know, because I think yeah. about this with myself occasionally, because, you know, I, we both run our own business and I'm like, there's something to be said for financial security, like a paycheck. It's a good question, dude. Yeah. I, I sometimes ask myself, but then again, I don't know. I think it depends on the person because I, you know, a lot of my friends don't do that. Mm-hmm. Actually, most of my friends don't, don't, <laughs> don't do business and mm-hmm. it's. You know they're they're perfectly happy, but I always felt like I was missing something. So even though it's been really hard to do business, it's always been almost like a you know scratching an itch that I, I kind of needed to yeah. uh, to scratch. Otherwise, I would have always wondered, you know, what if, what if, what if, what if I did that? What if I tried? And yeah, it ended up working out. So you know, <laughs> originally the the risk was pretty high, but I think it's just it's something that I've always figured I would do eventually. I was just so comfortable at Blizzard for so many years that I kind of paused on that, you know, on that thought for, yeah, for a while. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then when, you know, the, like layoffs started to happen at Blizzard and that's, I think that's kind of what made me realize that, okay, maybe, you know, I have family here now. I still, I'm not a citizen yet. So I have a green card, but I'm not a citizen yet. So, and back when that happened, I didn't have anything. So I had just like a visa. So I could basically get deported, you know, if I lost my job. So mm-hmm. that was kind of another extra factor in there that, you know, that kind of pushed me towards that route where I would I would be more in control of, of what happens to my mm-hmm. family, pretty much. And uh, but yeah, uh, it's not to say, though, that, you know, my job at Blizzard wasn't fun. It was it was a blast, you know, like the, the all the years I spent there. It was awesome. And like you say, it was stable. It was a high paying job. And I I felt probably that I, I would be able to make more if I if I if I quit, if I tried this, you know, if I tried a business route and if that worked out, mm-hmm. uh, which it did, thankfully. But 
yeah, I think it's just, you know, after after seven years, routine starts to, you know, to settle in for any kind of job, really. So either it was that or I would have probably moved to a different company just to try something new. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, anything that's super fun, you know, if you like an amusement park, if you go, if you go like a month straight, every day it gets, it gets old after a while, uh, even though it's a ton of fun the first couple of times. Um, yeah, that's, that's just kind of what happened. Yeah. I remember reading in one of, not reading, but listening in some video you put out there that it took QBrush a while to make any money. Like you guys were living off savings for a while. Yeah, yeah. So the main reason being that I never wanted to have to raise money. So I never went to investors trying to trying to basically build this thing on the back of somebody else, somebody yeah. else's money. And, you know, we had a pretty comfortable cushion when I when I quit Blizzard. So I figured... But, you know, at that time when I made the decision, I had already started uh, QBrush. So QBrush was already running. So I had some sort of proof right, that there was potential. I, I had yeah. enough data that I could see that, okay, there's a, you know, a growth uh, curve here. And it's it's going to take me where I'll be able to make as much eventually, soon enough, hopefully. And so I went I went in it based on that. And, yeah, of course, you know, like <laughs> like everything in business, shit happens. And yeah. uh, it took it took a bit longer. Uh, so yeah, we had to we had to pretty much use all our savings to keep that running. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, that definitely some some very very stressful times. As I'm sure you know, as a, as a business owner, you've probably experienced you know, similar stuff. Yeah, towards uh, at the every beginning, month, it was, every month. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. yeah, it was it was super rough at the beginning. It's you know it's still rough now. There's always patches, but. Yeah, uh, now it's you know it's a it's a well-oiled machine and it's kind of kind of working on its own and I'm just there to to steer it you know minor minor direction changes here and there but that's pretty much it. But I wanna uh, I got a couple more questions on the business side of this and then I want to jump into the art and uh, Rashid's asking I think a good question so we'll get into that. Favorite but um, how does this work as an artist and a businessman? And I'm kind of asking for myself here because <laughs> yes. it's like this is the perennial problem. Like I love to just get in and I'm 3D. I love to just like I'm just messing around with faces and trying to make my yeah. settings and change things around, right? And it's always these like small little things. And so I could spend like two hours screwing around with this stuff. But then, you know, that's two hours you're not spending on the business or on different things and maybe something yeah. about marketing. Like, how do you manage the business and the artist side, if at all? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I definitely do. It's always been very important for me to have art still, you know, in, in whatever I do. I tried for a little bit last year, I think at the, at the beginning of last year for a good stretch. I didn't do much art at all for about, I don't know, maybe like four or five months, something like that. Mm-hmm. And I just... I wasn't depressed, but it was just, I don't know. It's like I didn't have my, almost like I didn't have my stress relief or I didn't have my, like the one thing that makes me really, really happy, you know, and that was not taken away, but I was just, I wasn't doing it for a while. And then I started to feel like crap and I was wondering what's going on. And then, yeah, that that was the thing that was missing. I'm like, oh, maybe it's art. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start to paint again. And it just, everything got better once I started to do that again. So for me, it's more of a necessity. I don't have a choice. Otherwise, I, yeah. Otherwise, I'm too stressed out, I, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't feel happy. And so, the way I manage it, I have most of my day. So a good, a good eight hours a day is reserved for business. So I'll go, I'll go over like in the morning, uh, look at customer support stuff to see if if anything happens, if anything keeps coming back, and then we schedule tasks to fix that. We respond to a couple emails, and then it's yeah, meeting with my team. And after that, it's various work, business related, you know, it's either it can, I mean, there's so many tasks, you know, as a business owner, that's every day is pretty different, but sometimes it'll be like reaching out to different people, reaching out to different companies, trying to get them on a platform, trying to, yeah, deal making pretty much most of the day. And at the end of the day, usually I reserve that for, for art. So when the kids go to bed. And it's a little bit more quiet and it's not as, as hot in my office because <laughs> I chose the wrong the wrong spot to have an office. I have this huge <laughs> light wall right above my desk. So yeah. like around like around right now, it's it's shining down on me and it's pretty hot. It's pretty toasty. <laughs> so I try to keep the art for, for later when it's more yeah. comfortable. Yeah. Um, Does your house have AC? Because I know like so few houses in Laguna have AC. Do. Yeah, we do, thankfully, but for some reason. It's the least effective in this. In this, uh, <laughs> it's more like it'll have to be a freezer and and the rest of the house for this room to be comfortable. Got so, it. Yeah, don't count on that too much. 
Yeah, yeah um, we have no AC in our place and, and no plans to install one. You have to go through <laughs> approvals and the, the neighbor will be pissed off. Like yeah. Laguna is just crazy. Yeah, you need permits for everything. I know. Um, so is there a favorite part of this that you like? The, a favorite part of the, um, yeah, let's just say a favorite part of the day, like some part that's enjoyable, not the art. You can't cheat. That's obviously the favorite. Okay, 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 no cheating. I really like customer support, which might be strange because uh-huh. probably everybody that does that for a living and they hate their life. But I actually really enjoy that part of the day, like connecting with customers, seeing, you know, kind of what, what they need, what's not working for them, what's working for them. And kind of acting on that. And I think the best is when we release a feature that a lot of people have been asking for and it's right. well received, right? It's almost like, yeah, it's almost like releasing a, like a, releasing a painting or uh, submitting a painting to your portfolio and everybody likes it. It's a good feeling. And I think that would be that. And then just browsing the platform, you know, like selecting different things to, to be featured and looking at all the amazing, amazing products that pop up every day. But strangely, yeah, it's customer support for the most part. And then the other one that I also really, really enjoy would be the, the more creative part of the business where we design new features. So that's yeah. heavily, you know, I, I do a lot of the product design, product development. Yeah. And so, I'll, you know, working on different mockups to then hand off to my designer and yeah, trying to find like things that are going to make the website better, designing different things, you know, arranging stuff. It, I love this, this part because it's, it's more artistic. And those would be the two, the two, yeah, the two best ones. What I don't like usually, if it's not customer support, just random emails to different, you know, different companies or like third parties. And I, I hate all of that. The negotiation <laughs> but, and yeah, 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 not my favorite. I that's the part that I hated dealing with artists when I had to bring them in, and then we'd enter yeah. into negotiations. That oh my god, I just like that drove me nuts. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I was gonna say yeah. the. Um, because before QBrush was in its you know current state, I had yeah. another website before that it was it was you know, it was nothing like you no know, like your website, but it was mm-hmm. kind of similar in a way where you yeah. we would get uh, different artists to to create content for the website, yeah. and yeah, that that part dealing dealing with artists, <laughs> it's weird to say that because I'm an artist myself, but it's, it's hard. <laughs> they, they don't move. Yeah, um, it's all the time, and <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So. I'm happy That's now, right. you know, I, I don't have to handle a lot of that anymore. I uh-huh. am thankfully, so thank you. All right. Well, one more question here on, on QBrush and then let's jump into the art because um, cool. there's a lot of guys that wondering. So there's marketplaces out there. There's a lot of them. And so is there something specific about QBrush that you guys, like how you position yourself? Is there something specific about the art market uh, yeah. that's important? So, what is your thought there? Yeah. So originally we were the first marketplace for everything CG on mm-hmm. the internet ever. Since then, ArtStation, you know, they kind of you know, got heavily inspired and did the mm-hmm. same thing. But yeah, our main thing really is that we're a curated marketplace. So pretty much everything you find on the website is good stuff. You know, you don't have to to shuffle through a lot of subpar assets to find maybe like the one gem that you that you really need. Mm-hmm. And so there's that aspect. And also the profit share that artists make is highest than anything out there. We have this uh, affiliate partnership feature now, which essentially gives you, you know, 10% of everything that you that you refer to the that any sale that you're able to refer to the website. So if you're if you're a seller, on top of having your own store, you you know, whenever you share your products, people can can click on your links, they visit your store, they're like, oh, that's cool. You know, they might buy something from your store, even if they don't. Whatever else they decide to buy ever, you know, after clicking your links, the affiliate will make 10% of that. And the seller also will make 10%. So basically if you're a seller, you share your product online, and if somebody clicks on your stuff, buys it, you get you know 95% of the profits. If it's, it's it's your own content, so you did all the marketing, you shared your stuff, you know you keep all the profits. And if somebody purchases something on somebody else's store, you make 10% on that sale. So even though it's not your store, because we referred somebody to QBrush, essentially you helped us with our marketing, then we reward you with 10%. So as sellers have that already, which you know if they're popular, this means that their profit share can rise above 100%, which is, yeah, just this, that's not a thing <laughs> normally. No other mm-hmm. platforms have that. And then, yeah, if you're just an affiliate, you don't want to sell anything. But if you're an artist, you have a big platform, maybe you're popular on Instagram or something like that, and you want to make money, you can you know, you share any QBrush link and you make 10% on those sales too. So 
Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's jump into the art now. We're looking, there's a lot of freaking art, man. This is awesome. A couple of questions that come up. Let me see. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, Rashid's asking, any specific influences that help you develop your style? Initially, Dragon Ball. I said I'm old, I'm not that old. So Dragon Ball was a big thing when I was younger. That was a mm-hmm. huge influence. And the um, the art booklets from Diablo and Warcraft, those were my two main influences. So a little bit of Japanese culture in there, a little bit of Western culture kind of mixed together. And that's really what, what I loved, you know, and that's kind of stayed the same way. So along the way, you know, as I was growing up, some artists left and right kind of inspired me, but nobody that I can really pinpoint other than those two that I mentioned. So it's been just, yeah, like maybe some artist has a cool color palette on one of, the, one of their paintings. I'm like, oh, that's, that's nice. Maybe I'll, I'll try to do that for something else later. Yeah, that, that was it. You know, I feel like I've had so many ideas in my head. I barely have time to paint them all. Mm-hmm. So I haven't, like I rarely, for example, I rarely go on ArtStation. It's not updated at all. Uh, I should probably put a bunch more stuff on there. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> my brain is my art station almost. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hume Tai Kim maybe was one, another one. A Korean artist when I was younger, just because yeah. of his, his anatomy, like style as anatomy, the way that he paints. Yeah, I don't know. Like a lot of artists have a list of names that inspire them. I never had that. And maybe it's because I don't look at the names and I don't save the names. I don't try to remember them. Maybe I should make more of an effort. But yeah. <laughs> what are some of the um, common mistakes that people make? And uh, by common, I mean, it's a little bit easy of a thing to say. Like, what are some of the um, biggest issues you see people making as beginning concept artists? Like, let's just focus on concept right now. You um, mean like when they, when they find work? or before Yeah, they find work? before they find work, they're educating themselves and they're trying to put themselves in a position to get a job. Like, what are mm-hmm. some of the common mistakes that they make? Do they spend too much time on something or? I mean, so like there's different levels, right? So the, the portfolio as a whole, then the pieces themselves. Portfolio wise, the biggest problem that I see most people have, and I mean that like most people, is that their portfolio is not tailored to what they want to do enough. Mm-hmm. So let's say you're, uh, yeah, let's say you want to be a character artist, right? A character 3D artist. And like sometimes they'll have some like props in there or environments. And it really depends on what your end goal is. But essentially, if you want to go and work in a AAA studio, you have to be super specialized. If you don't want to do that, if you want to work for an indie studio, then you have to be able to do multiple things. So mm-hmm. it really depends on the direction that people take. But usually people want to work in a AAA studio. That's kind of the... That's the dream, you know, at least it was for me. I don't yeah. know. I don't know if that's the case for most people, but I would think so because that's where the, the big money is. And so if you want to work there, then yeah, your portfolio has to be very, very specialized, very targeted to what you what you enjoy. Uh, I have some friends, you know, that <laughs> had portfolios that were a little bit more, a little bit more varied, let's say. And when they got the job, they got tasked to do something else completely, you know, something that that they had in their portfolio. So the, the employers knew that they could do that. And they brought them on as a, let's say, like a character artist, but they ended up doing a lot of props and maybe some environments. And mm. that's not at all what they would, that's not at all what they wanted. That's not, that's not what they love. So make sure that your portfolio represents exactly what you want to do and focus on that thing. And then in terms of art itself, uh, that's, that's a little bit harder, but it's, I guess it still relates to the portfolio in a way. Look at, uh, look at what other artists are doing, you know, like other artists in the studios that you're interested in. Let's say you want to work for Blizzard, look at, uh, yeah, go on like our station, whatever other website and find the portfolio of artists that work on those teams. You know, the, the name's pretty easy to find. You can, just, you know, look on, on Facebook, whatever, find people that work at Blizzard and try to look for their, their portfolio. And if you want a job there, you know, you need to be at least able to match that or close or better, even, even better. But yeah, it's just having a portfolio that's tailored for what you want to do. It seems like obvious uh, mm-hmm. once you've done it for a long time. But yes, yeah, as, as someone who's starting and trying to find your direction as, as an artist, maybe that's a little bit more abstract of a concept or maybe it's not as obvious. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I get that. So, and uh, yeah. But if you're just starting out and somebody says, focus on what you want to do, part of it, you're not quite sure what you want to do. But at the other time, the other part of but it do you is... Think so? the, do you think that's true though? Because I don't, know. I don't know, like I always do the same test. You know, when somebody tells me that, I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. close your eyes. That you have a blank sheet of paper. What are you going to draw right now? 
And right. there's always a preference, you know, even though you might not be the best at that, maybe you're, you're really good at something else, but yeah. that, that one thing that shows up in your mind, you know, like the first impulse kind of thing, that should be what you go after. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of always what I've done. You know, I, I never really worked on environments because it wasn't, it wasn't really my calling. I was fascinated with characters. So I was lucky in that sense because I knew what I wanted. But even the people that say that they don't, there's always a preference. If you dig deep enough, you can always kind of tell, okay, so... You like this and this maybe a little bit more and then you like this and this and this and that essentially means that you like characters better or you like environments better. Mm -hmm. so I think just like self-reflection or like talking to, yeah, talking to maybe more experienced artists to to help them figure that out. The sooner you do, the better because you know, yeah. you're wasting time. Does it um, maybe come down to confidence too, you know, because maybe people put stuff in their portfolio because they're not quite confident that they can get the character job, let's say. That's their dream. Yeah, I'm sure that's some of that. Yeah, but it's hard because, you know, back when we were, you know, kind of growing as young artists, you could hardly find something like this, right? Something like ArtStation, uh, right. something like CG Society it was it was just starting pretty much. And there's no Instagram. So it was a lot harder to feel inferior, I guess. Uh, <laughs> right now, you just right now you open your browser and you're like, oh, crap. There's so many talented artists everywhere. What am I? How am I going to get there? How long is it going to take? Um, but back in the days, you kind of were clueless about it. Well, yeah. How many artists there are? Maybe 100? Who knows? <laughs> um, I have a shot, I'm sure. Um, so, That's yeah, kind of much, much harder like to yeah. feel inferior. I love that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very easy today. Yeah. I don't remember um, ever. I don't remember ever asking myself that question back in the days, and it's because, yeah, there was not much to look at. You know, some forums here and there, but to find stuff that was really, really good, you had to dig. You know, it was it was some work. Right now, it just it just jumps in your face everywhere. Yeah. It does. So, how do we know when we're ready? How how is a, an artist supposed to be like? Okay, I can get a job, or and you know, because as artists, we're always seeing the problems. We're always seeing the work. We we know where we've got to go. How do we know we're ready? Mm. So I might not be the best person to ask uh, this question to because I I don't know. I've never had to apply directly. So I never really was put in the position where, okay, is my, is my work good enough to apply to a company? And instead, I was just kind of doing art and it started... It's more like I started to see signs that there was potential there. So that's what kept me going long yeah. enough that I was eventually offered a position. But yeah, I didn't, I don't know, to find when you're ready. The most obvious way would be to, again, look at what other artists, maybe other junior artists, you know, in the companies that you're interested uh, to work at, look at their portfolio, look at yours, compare, you know, is, how far am I? Is, is it pretty close? Is it comparable? If that guy got hired with that portfolio and your portfolio is kind of similar, there's a good chance that you're ready to. So that would be my suggestions. Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah, to know, you're, to know you're ready, it's hard. A lot of it is confidence. And confidence is, uh, <laughs> I don't think there's a, a solution to, to gain more of it unless you know of one solution. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, I always tell people it's, it, it's the gift you give yourself, but you give it through the work you do, you know. And it's it's just the constant practice, which I think is one of the things that I was noticing in you is you're you're always practicing, you're always working. Yeah, because I know that it works, right? So whenever I do a big sprint of art, and I always give myself like small small challenges, uh, like personal challenges, so that I have kind of a, a goal to accomplish, and you know that can last for uh, I know. So for example, like the art school program that I'm putting together right now. Mm -hmm. uh, to put it together, to be able to teach it, I had to, I have to, you know, patch up a lot of the holes in my fundamentals. So I had to go through a lot of books, uh, just study a lot of basic stuff. And yeah, basically just study a lot for a really, really long period of time. And that was hard. It was really, really hard. It was, it was painful. I don't like studying. But at the end of it, I could see... It was almost like magic. You know, it's almost like you've acquired a new skill. You level up, cling, and... <laughs> It was really that feeling. So it's a, it's a good feeling uh, mm -hmm. and, and I know it works. So, you know, that's kind of the motivation behind it. I know that it's hard work and while I'm doing it, it might not be the most, the most fun. Maybe it's frustrating. Maybe I can't do something right. can do it as well as I wanted. But I know that if I keep going, 
at you know maybe like a year from now, I'll look back, I'll look back at my art a year prior, and I'll be like, yeah, yeah I've come a long way, and that's kind of what keeps me going. I love Where you know because you're in you're in development. I love how you mentioned sprint, you know, and I think that that's one of the things that's not like a. I think it's easy for artists to just get stuck into the work, 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 work mode. But in development, you work in sprints. Do you mind defining that for people who don't quite get that? Yeah, <laughs> you do work in sprints a lot, yes. So I guess, you know, most people are probably familiar with just crunch time, right? Uh, work, mm-hmm. uh, and it's basically when the game maybe is falling a little bit behind on schedule, or maybe you want, you know, you want to hit release date or there's a, like a patch coming up and you're not quite there. Like the team will probably miss the deadline or the checkpoint if they don't hire more people and usually they don't instead they'll just ask their employees to do more more time work over time and it's it works for games right so people just stay a little bit longer they power through like a certain amount of time and then after that the sprint is over the game is in a good spot and then you can move on and you have like a final product a little bit sooner so you know, working in sprints as an artist it's not always comfortable but it's kind of the same so while you're doing it it can easily be seen as a chore almost, but you know that at the end, there's the reward. So all the work that you're doing, you know, it'll pay off. So I don't know if that's if that's what you, you were asking, but yeah, that's kind of how I see it. Got it. All right. So we talked a little bit about how do we know when you are ready. We talked a little bit about sprints and process. I think it might be wise for us to talk a little bit more about process to help people kind of understand. Uh, mm-hmm. A little bit, and I think one of these, if I remember right, actually shows process. Is there one of these that you would recommend that really walks through process? A lot of them do, but it's like in a form of time lapse, you know, like uh, yeah. I think I, I talk over, but yeah, like this one, I think. So when you're starting with this, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting to document is is process, but specifically, you know, how, well, if I look at it from my perspective, it's like, how do we finish things and how messy are things in the beginning? That's actually where I'm kind of going with this. Yeah, yeah. It's easy, I think, for us to be judgmental in the beginning of processes, but process in and of itself is really designed to organize chaos. So like in my beginning, my process, I'm very chaotic and, you know, yours is rock solid and all that stuff. But if you can well, talk uh, about the process and how it works and that notion of, of it, I think it'd be great. Yeah. So like process is something that is painful for everybody. I think everybody in you know, there's the final result, like you're saying, the final result is one thing, but the process to get there is, is, is another part, you know, of the battle. I still feel like my process, and this is actually, I consider this to be old, like the one that's, that I'm painting right now. So I see mm-hmm. a lot of flaws, I see a lot of problems in it already. Yeah. Um, but I think as you get better, you know, the process, so it almost adds double, you only imagine the end result, but as you're working towards that, you can see that it's going well. And I didn't have much of that at all, you know, when I was when I was a younger artist. So I would just start something and it would be, yeah, complete chaos. And I'm like, I don't know if this is worth continuing. I have kind of an idea in my mind, but what I'm seeing right now, my canvas really doesn't look like anything. Mm-hmm. And so it's almost like, you know, you got to try and maybe likely it won't work. Usually it didn't. But yeah, it was kind of that... I don't know, like ignorance, maybe, you know, mm-hmm. I, I didn't really have any any expectations or not that high of an expectation for my work. So something that actually helped me and is good that you're playing the video because I look at those recordings every time, every time I, I make one, like multiple mm-hmm. times, actually. And so I'll not only be critical of kind of the final results, but also the process, because in a way, you know, I'm uploading this on YouTube. I want people to to be entertained, maybe you know, at, at least. If they can learn something, that's that's a bonus. But at least have it be entertaining. And so if you know if the process is super messy the whole time and it only comes together at the end, I don't know. I feel like this is not as as interesting. Maybe so. Mm-hmm. I've been working a lot on that. You know, trying to make the process different steps, clear steps. Okay, I've reached this. Now I'll move on to the next one. Kind of what I did now. You know, I finished the sketch. Now I'm moving on to like cleaning up the sketch. And then after that, I move on to colors and then final you know final polish. So yeah, I don't think I had. That as much as when I was working on, on uh, 3D, because you're, I don't know, in, like in your case, right? Like you work on, on personal art most of the time mm-hmm. when it comes to your, your 3D work, even though, you know, it might be related to the business, but it's something that no, like nobody asks you to do it, right? So you choose to do it on your own. And I think I, 
like 3D for me when I was working at, at Blizzard, for example, it was more of a, um, like I handed a sketch or like a concept and I have yeah. to do that, right? So there's not as much of a, like a search and that the process is already established. Everybody's doing the same thing. You know, you, you start in ZBrush, you, you model this, 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 you start with the body and then you move on to, you know, different things, whatever. And then the rest of the process is kind of set in stone. So you don't really have to think about it. But yeah, for personal arts, it's a little bit different. But what I think helps in a sense is if you put yourself in that same scenario, even if you don't need to put yourself in a scenario where you're going to be working. Imagine that you're working in a production and you have like a concept that's handed off to you. Maybe you did it, whatever, but go through the process as if you were working for real. So hit the different steps, you know, maybe I'm sure you can, you can learn that stuff the different steps and go through the same thing. And that's essentially what you're going to be doing at work if you end up working in, you know, in 3D. So the same with, the same with 2D, you know, if you don't know what to work on, if you're, if you're looking at your canvas and you're like, what, what should I do? Create a fake project for yourself, you know, whatever it is, like a fake game. Maybe you're working on a game and try to imagine, try to come up with a, yeah, like a random game that, that you think could be cool and start working on art for that game, even though it's not a real game. It's just like the project itself. It adds a lot to the to the process. Mm -hmm. Got it. I feel like. Yeah, and you mentioned you review these things and uh, try to look at it with a critical eye. How does it work for you with the critical eye, but not being like a jerk? You know, um. <laughs> he, he, you know, constructively criticizing yourself because you're also like, you know, you're kind of like me. You know, you just you just here working on your own off to the side. You don't have necessarily a team per se, right? Or am I wrong? Uh, for art, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's just, yeah, it's just, uh, art is just something that is like the fun part of my day, the most yeah. fun part of my day. Uh, yeah, no, no team. But when you're in a studio, you got a team, you got deadlines, you got, you know, there's a lot more that keeps you internally moving. Yeah. Uh, so it's, I found it easier outside of that, you know, when it's more personal work to, to have that negativity creep in. So is there something that, you do that helps you with the negativity yeah so you mean like looking at uh like you can't do something or you can't do it as well yeah um, hitting instagram hitting art station and you know feeling like crap <laughs> yeah yeah it's more like when i'm at where i'm at now i know what it takes to get to get there even though i might not be there right i uh, know process. i can gauge yeah i can gauge the amount of work the amount of study that'll take me to get to that level if i'm not there yet so if I look at a piece of art and I'm like, wow, this is, this is freaking amazing, it, way above my level, but I'm really bummed down about something that's really, really good. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that I hear from people, you know, that they look at art that's really, really good and they get, they get almost like depressed. Like, I'll never yeah. reach that level. Yeah. And it, right now it's, it's a little bit different. So my take is more, okay, I know that'll take me, it'll take me some time, but I can get there if I do this, 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 and that, you know, I know uh -huh. the steps to get there. So yeah. I think that's a huge, yeah, huge, huge factor. So looking at these videos, you know, hopefully it helps others kind of go through the same thing without, like, they see the process. You know, they can they can see how it's done, and so hopefully they know that yeah, if they you know if you do more and more and more and more and more, you get there too. But yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Just being aware of process and thinking of it as process. Yeah. And I think process is one of the like it's the least talked about thing. I tell my students a lot that you know mastery is not magic; it's just process. You do the same mm -hmm. steps that you know quote unquote masters do, then you'll you'll have it. it just takes yeah that process. And um, like uh, yeah. yeah, just to jump in that on that too, the. Uh, like the, 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 I was for a long time when I, when I was working at Blizzard, you know, I thought, I thought I was, I was pretty good. Right. So I, I'm like, oh yeah, I found a job at Blizzard. I'm, I'm the shit probably. They wouldn't <laughs> hire me otherwise. Um, yeah. but because of that, I didn't, I didn't study much, you know, when I was working at Blizzard. So I did, I did fun. I did fun stuff, you know, stayed well within my comfort zone and really, yeah, didn't, didn't, didn't study much, didn't, didn't try to improve that much. And, the one thing that made me improve the most was when I started to work on art school and when I worked on foundation stuff. So mm -hmm. like all the basics. And to me, that's been the biggest gain. That's why I emphasize the most now because I've seen it, you know, for myself, it helps everything. It's almost like it, it multiplies your skill because it can be applied to so many different things. And instead of working on those specializations, if you just work on that, that can be applied to all those specializations. It's you know, like you get uh, so much for your, your time, your, your time investment. Mm -hmm. That's uh, yeah. That's kind of that's kind of what I focus on now. 
basics. That's what are the basics? Like, uh, what do you mean when you say that? Are we talking anatomy? Are we talking? Yep. Yep. Anatomy, anatomy, perspective, just, yeah, seeing, seeing volumes in space, foreshortening, all those, all those kinds of stuff. Anybody can do it. You know, this is kind of stuff that they teach in school. And a lot of people probably feel, and I feel, I, I felt the same way too. But a lot of people just feel like it's, ah, it's like a chore. You know, I kind of get, I have to get through that and then now I'll be able to move on to the cool stuff after. Mm-hmm. But it's really not the, the right way to, to look at it, I think. You know, I was talking about the, like leveling up, feeling like you leveled up in art. It's always a feeling that I get after working on fundamentals, less uh, like specialized skills, like how to render water or whatever. I don't, you know, you don't get much of that feeling then. You really get it. Or at least I really get it when I work on a good stretch of fundamentals. And like in my case, you know, I do a lot of characters. So yeah, anatomy is probably the biggest. Is the there, biggest um, yeah, is there, because anatomy, I find anatomy is like, it's like a, it's a planet, you know, it's yeah. huge, everything. So when we say anatomy, what does that mean to you in terms of being an artist and getting better? Like what's Maybe, maybe you'll focus? be able to relate to this. Yeah. I've asked myself that a lot because it's, yeah, there's a lot of things. And if you're, you know, if, if I'm going to teach it, I need to I don't know, like have a good grasp on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably a good idea. And I think the way I see it now, it's, it's almost like a puzzle, you know, anatomy, where you start and you have like a thousand pieces and it just is just super scary. How am I going to finish this? There's no way. But, you know, as you, I'm not a big puzzle, <laughs> puzzle doer. And I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I have words for that, but uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't do puzzles that much. But from uh, from what I remember when I was younger, uh, you know, you start with the edges or the corners or whatever, and then you kind of create the frame so that you know that all the other pieces that are left are going to fit in that. And then having kind of like those sides first and that 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 frame first done is a good motivation. And you kind of kind of I treat anatomy the same way. So. At the beginning, it's really, really scary. But the second that you start to look at those things and like the frame, like the skeleton, how the, just the basics, how that works. And then you start to add more and more pieces, more and more pieces. And the more pieces you add, the more the picture becomes clear. And even though it might not be at the end, you know, if you have enough pieces in there, it can be just half the pieces, but you can still have a really, really good idea already. And I think it just speeds up over time. Like you get increasingly faster or increasingly better at anatomy. Mm-hmm. Just because you're starting to see more of that picture in the end, and uh, the last steps is just adding those those final pieces that takes your whole life pretty much. But I, yeah, I see it that way. It's very very scary at the beginning, but it starts to make sense. It's hard to imagine that it ever that it ever gets to that point. You know, if you're if you're just starting, but it really does. Mm. I love that actually. Thinking of it in terms of a puzzle, how important is the verbiage to you? You know, because I. <laughs> Yeah. It's not it its own important. language, basically. Yeah, yeah, it is important in the sense that it, just from like a learning perspective, it helps you remember things when you mm-hmm. associate like words to images. Yeah, it's just easier to remember this way. So, even though it might seem like an extra thing that you have to learn, which is kind of true, but at the same time, it makes you remember the muscle better. I think it's very important. I used to think the complete opposite. I used to think that who cares about the names? You know, that's just more stuff to remember. Mm-hmm. But now that I've been teaching it and I've actually, yeah, tried to remember all the all the names, uh, how everything's connected and all that stuff, that's really when it starts to make the most sense. That's when the puzzle is starting to to look like an actual actual image. Yeah. That's what I love about thinking of it as a puzzle is because the language is a puzzle. It's like the lateral <laughs> epicondyle, you know, it's like yeah. Lateral is outside, epicondyle is a part of the bone, yada, yada. So if you can see that puzzle part, then it starts to all come together. Exactly. And I don't know about you, but it feels good, you know, to know the stuff. <laughs> I don't know. It's like a, almost like a superpower in a way. Yeah. You know, it's, like it's as close as we'll, as artists will feel as, as super. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I would think it's a similar yeah. feeling. Yeah, that's great. You've acquired, yeah. something and you've acquired something and and now you know it. It's like once you have the names and the muscles and we can remember both, it's hard to forget. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I think that's the main difference. Yeah. Although, you know, I've known several amazing artists that could not, like, for example, you know, we're in a workshop with Richard McDonald and he's forgetting mm-hmm. names, you know, but I mean, he's forgetting names like the Palmaris longest, you know, it's like, Jesus, yeah. if you're remembering that, doing, then, you know all good so yeah, yeah, you yeah. can forget that we'll forgive you yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> give you a pass 
But then the idea of superpower brings up my kryptonite, which is color theory. Yeah. What the, and how the hell do you teach that? You know, because I remember learning that in college. I went to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and man, you know, they found every way under the sun to screw that up. And uh, the only time I understood color was actually researching Odd Nerdrum. Researching what? Odd Nerdrum, the painter. Okay. okay. And he paints in the five color palette of uh, Zorn, Norwegian. Okay. And it's, it's all like earth tones, no prismatics. Mm-hmm. You know? So it's like, that's the only time I understood it. But color theory, how does this work for you? How do you explain how to work with color? You've got the Isle of Chroma. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. the way that I teach it is... The best way, I don't really know any other way, but I teach what made sense to me. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's kind of what I did initially is you just really go by the books, you know, well, you different color and you just use colors. That's the, and I did that unknowingly when I was, when I was kind of growing as an artist, I would look at somebody else's painting where I thought the colors were great. And I would literally just steal the palette, you know, work on my own art, but it would be like a very, very, very similar color palette. And mm-hmm. so I didn't have to think about it that way. So I just, you know, I grabbed something that worked and tried to make it work on my own stuff. And for me, that that worked, you know, for, for a number of years. But uh, now to teach it, I think what makes the most sense to me now is that you really just do the same thing, but look at, you know, actual real color harmonies that mm-hmm. exist, not just somebody's uh, somebody's painting. Uh, although it might be good, but maybe maybe not. Who knows? Um, so so yeah, looking at, I know, like you you. Take like an analogous uh, color harmony. So all colors are close together in the chromatic circle. Mm-hmm. And you can pick, you know, any region. There's tools. I think it's uh, what color.adobe.com. I think. Is that it? Let me check real quick. Color.adobe.com. Maybe it's colors with an S. Oh, yeah. No, there you go. That works. Yeah. Color.adobe.com. And it's. It's a tool they have like the most common color harmonies and you can like really easily generate color palettes there. So that's what I recommend people try first. You know, it's almost like uh, you're learning to be a chef. They're not going to ask you to be to be creative. You know, you know, like, OK, here are the recipes. Nail those recipes. Once you're able to to follow the recipe, then you can venture on your own and try different things. You know, try to change it up, spice things up. But if you don't know any recipes, use the ones that are known to work. So. I'm really more by the book in that sense. Mm-hmm. And it seems that it's been working with my students. So, yeah, I don't know. How do you Got approach it? it? Painfully. <laughs> Very painfully. <laughs> Tears, cold Tears. showers. Yeah. The analogous works um, for me. Like uh, skin is usually some sort of red to yellow to, to desaturated yellow. Yeah. But along the lines of your students and in terms of concept art, does somebody have to go to school to be a concept artist? No, 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 no. No, no, uh, don't do that. I mean, going, no, like going to um, like your kind of workshops, I think that's that's probably the best just because it's, yeah, it's significantly cheaper than school and mm-hmm. you learn you learn exactly what you're supposed to. And there's not, a, there's not a bunch of other things attached to it. So, yeah, no, to, to be a concept artist, I tell the same to everybody. I didn't go to school for it. You don't need to go to school for it. It's a huge dump of money. If anything, you'll be in debt for the rest of your life if you even make it. So there's so many resources online. Just learn online. Start with YouTube. And then if you, yeah, if that's not going to be enough after, after a while, after you get to a certain level, then look for, uh, look for paid content by actual working professionals and learn directly from them. Almost mm-hmm. like uh, if you can find a mentorship, even better. Uh, if you can afford it, but, but yeah, no, you don't need you don't need school at all. You can draw as a baby, as a kid. You know? <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't need anything for that. That's great. That's true. What do you need in your portfolio though? Because it, it's a portfolio centric job. You got to have a portfolio, yeah. and your competition is basically anybody who can draw and anybody who's got like a Wacom tablet. So it's higher yeah. than say 3D. 3D's got a little bit higher threshold. Yeah, the um, barrier of entry is really really low. Yeah. So I imagine it's competitive marketplace. Yes, it it is. But it's also, you know, as an artist, it's not only art. So that's the, that's the one thing that's important. Like it can be only art if you're in the top 0.1 percent. 
uh, of artists, you know, if you're like really, really, really good and people, you like, you don't even need to do anything and people will share your stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. That's pretty rare. You know, those, those only like only a few rock stars out there for whom that's true. But for the most part, regular artists, you know, like myself, uh, <laughs> you have to use your marketing skills. And if you don't have any, you should learn them. It's just you're marketing yourself. You're selling something, right? You're selling your, even though you might not be selling, you know, you might not be exchanging money, but you're trying to get people to to look at your stuff. You're trying mm-hmm. to sell them their time in a way. Uh, yeah, and that's it. It takes it takes a uh, takes a marketing background a little bit to be able to do that effectively. So even though you you might not be the best artist, if you can market yourself well enough, if you can create like a persona online that is appealing to other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're you know, humble enough, if you help out people, if you participate, you know, in, in different competitions, basically try to be seen, go where people are, where people are looking at stuff, be active. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. But if you're using all the tools that are available, which most people aren't, you can gain a, an edge that way. Hmm. And I think, I think that's the biggest. Because when I was, again, like I, I was nowhere near the best artist. Like I started on Debian Arts. And I was I was crap, you know. There's so many so many talented artists out there, but what I I think the reason why I was I was eventually offered a job at Blizzard is because I just was everywhere, you know. Even the smaller websites where maybe like a couple hundred people are gonna see my stuff, maybe I'll get like five likes on it, doesn't matter. I would post absolutely everywhere, try to be seen as much as possible, and I know that that might be uncomfortable for some people, you know, like you're almost like. Yeah, like overselling is not really, but yeah, you, you have to, you have to, you know, <laughs> if you don't, nobody's going to see you. Nobody's going to ask you, hey, do you have something to show? There's so much stuff everywhere. So you have to be a little bit aggressive there and kind of use every option, every tool that you can find. Do you think that's just as true today? Yeah, it's more true today, I think. You can't be on just one social media platform. If you're doing that, you're like others will, will pass you, right? So if they, if they post on Instagram, on Facebook, on everywhere, and you're only doing a few of them, well, they have more reach than you. And therefore, likely, you know, if your art is equivalent, they'll likely have more opportunities than you as a result. Mm. So, yeah, it's use every tool. It's a, it's a big part of it is marketing. Like I would say about half the time that you spend as an artist will be dedicated to just commenting on other people. You know, if you if you give good feedback, people will notice you and like, oh, who's that guy? Click. It's almost like a free way to insert a link to your portfolio. If you give critique yeah. to somebody, if it's a good critique, you know, I know like for myself, you know, if somebody gives me a good critique, I look at their stuff. I'm like, who's that? Who's that person? You want to know, is that person any good? Is is it that person not good? Regardless, you click on that person's name and you go, you go check it out. And that's a click they would have normally not gotten if they hadn't commented. And yeah. so, yeah, it's like a way to insert yourself in the spotlights. So it takes some time. It takes time out of your day, but it pays off in the long term. It's a great point. One of my marketing consultants calls that farming. You go out <laughs> and you just post comments yeah. and you you and then that leads people back to you and to your site and, and all of that. Yeah, like plant seeds everywhere and yeah. maybe something will pay off. Yeah. Yeah, like exactly. That. It's interesting that you bring up that it's not really about being the best artist in some cases. Mm. And I think this is an important conversation I I have with my students because I feel like as artists, our goal is always is to be as awesome as possible to be better. Yeah, That's that's our internal goal. Like, I don't know any artist that's like, I'm just going to like screw off. I mean, not nobody I train or work with. We want to be the best. But then it's easy for us to also be like, well, I'm not ready. I'm not going to post. I'm not going to share until I'm better. And I'm, and then while that's happening, I see other people go and just get the job because they're out putting themselves out there and they're presenting themselves and they're being visible. And as you said, getting reach. And so it's, you have to have this balance. Otherwise you're in an ivory tower and you know, you might be great in five years, but you're in a freaking ivory tower. Yep. 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 It's, I know because a lot of artists are introverted. So Mm -hmm. this is uh, like an uncomfortable thing to do, like to market yourself so directly, so obviously. But this is beautiful cross hatching I'm seeing, by the way. I mean, this is just, I love this. It's like (laughs) field day for cross hatching. 
Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I interrupted though. You were saying it's uncomfortable for people. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's especially yeah, especially for artists. You know, it's something that's that's hard for us to do. Uh, we're not salespeople, really. Yeah. Um, at least I sure wasn't. You know, complete introvert. I'm much happier at my desk, working on my own stuff, uh, not talking to people. I love it when I talk to people, though. But I'm not. You know, if I have to do this all day long, it's draining compared to like uh, outgoing people where it's actually a refill of energy. You know, if you go out yeah. there talking to people, it actually gives you energy. For me, it's a complete opposite. Not to say that I don't enjoy it, but that's, yeah, it's, it's draining over time. So it's hard, you know, for somebody in a position like this to actively put yourself out there, uh, try to, yeah, try to look for, for ways to show off in a way, you know, that's kind of, there's a little mm-hmm. bit of that. Yep. Uh, it's like, hey, here's what I did. Do you like it? If you like it, you know, cool. Yeah. That's one thing that I wish I had a better tip for it. It's just, you got to do it. If you don't do it, you won't make it. So, yeah. There's too much uh, competition. You got to be yeah. visible. Exactly. You don't have a choice. If you don't yeah. do it, you're not going to make it as an artist. You, yeah. you might get really, really good and work on your own stuff, but nobody's going to know about it. And yeah. you, won't have those, you won't have those opportunities that, that other people have. Yeah. That might be That's completely cool. inferior to you, in technical wise. Yeah, absolutely. Edison, I'm actually glad you're here. Edison's one of my uh, students. Edison, this conversation is really important for you about the reach, posting, actually, and getting, because you're doing so many awesome things, but are you doing them in six different forums and all over the place? All right, yeah, man, this is great. So is my introverted as well? My, no. She's a complete opposite of me. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way sonia is she's like she recharges talking to people i yeah. oh my god i was just like you know, <laughs> yeah you're kind of like me this just does not work go to a part or go to those those um the family things like what was the last family thing we were at it at school yeah, yeah that's yeah yeah well Lots of talking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah talking with other dads and i go oh, kill me now <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 don't come this way. No. Ah. <laughs> Crap. I have to engage. Yeah. All right, my friend. Well, it's been great talking to you. And um, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and, and your advice. It's uh, a pleasure. It's, uh, time went really quickly. Uh, yeah. yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right, guys, you know Cube Brush. Head over to Cube Brush, start your stores and produce awesome content there. That actually fits into the whole marketing thing. Make sure you're producing awesome content um, because that makes a difference. Even if you don't, you can be an affiliate. So that's that's the other part that's cool. Because even if you're not not a content creator, you can still be a partner on QBrush and and just share cool stuff. You know, let's say you finished a painting and you used somebody else's brush set. You're like, hey, I did this painting with this brush set. And that link is going to be an actual affiliate link. So when people click on it, if they buy something, anything on QBrush doesn't even have to be that that one asset and that one brush set, you profit from it. So a good way to kind of monetize your your fan base, you know, if it's uh, if it's growing. Uh, so yeah, on top of being a seller, just wanted awesome. to add that. All right, Mark, thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for being here. And um, I guess I got to jump into a class. I'm a little late for a class. Yeah. <laughs> Get to work, man. Get to work. Slacking off. <laughs> All right, Mark. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. See you guys. All right. So I want to thank you so much for being here, for taking the time, and for listening to this podcast. And I want to ask a couple of things from you. Number one, make sure you leave a comment or you rate this on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is that you're getting this. That's going to make a big difference in helping us get the word out and get people to know who we are. All right. The other thing is I want to make sure you know where to find us. So you can head over to www.gameartinstitute.com where you can learn about our flagship program, which is the Game Artist Boot Camp. This, this is designed for those who are really looking to move the needle on their career and really lock in that job. You may have gone to school and learned a bunch, maybe haven't learned a bunch, But at the Game Art Institute, the primary focus we have is the very specific industry skills 
the triggers that you really need to hit in that job interview. What are the specific things that they're looking for? That's what we're going to be training you on. We're taking applications right now for environment artists and for character artists. So make sure you head over to www.gameartinstitute.com and apply today. That way we can have that conversation, make sure this is a fit for you, make sure that you're a fit for it. And if everything is perfect, then we will sign you up for that right away and get you into your training and start moving the needle on your career. All right. Thank you so much again for being here. Take care. Have an amazing day.